Hi, welcome to the NASCAR and NBC podcast. I'm your host, Nate Ryan, joined by NASCAR and NBC analyst and our resident NASCAR Hall of Famer, Dale Jarrett. We're talking on the day after the round of 12 opener at Texas Motor Speedway that was won by William Byron. And DJ, uh, a lot to talk about, as always, with the playoff race and at Texas. uh, 100 fewer miles this year, but I think almost as much chaos as they had last year, especially toward the end. I think there were two restarts in particular that certainly defined how this race unfolded. Um, so I'm going to start there before we go to the winner, William Byron. I want to start with the lap 248 restart where Kyle Larson is in the lead, uh, appears to be headed toward the victory here, um, running side by side with Bubba Wallace. Larson's on the bottom and the car just seemed to snap. He just lost rear traction into turn one. Um, Larson said afterward, you know, he's surprised you don't normally get sucked around like that. And, um, these kind of cars that, that was sort of like the style more with the old car than this car. And he wasn't expecting to lose it. So your analysis of that, did it catch you by surprise as well that, uh, we saw Kyle Larson, who's, you know, one of the best drivers in cup, just lose it on a restart. Yeah, that, that was certainly surprising because I think the one thing that, that we talk about with Larson is his car control, uh, the majority of the time. And, uh, but I also believe this is a perfect example of you know just how hard uh, these cars are to drive and how hard the the drivers are having to push things at the end of the race especially when they get these restarts uh, at the high speed racetracks um i the, the one thing that i noticed and i watched it back a couple of times to make sure that i wasn't seeing something but i actually saw this happen like the lap before um larson actually spun was he still uh, even racing side by side with Bubba, he wanted to make his arc into, especially turn one, as much as he could, uh, because that's the way he drives. That's why how he gets speed out of his car. Uh, his car turns to center, and he's able to to power up soon and and drive straighter on the exit of the corner and and just make a lot of speed there. Uh, your problem is that you set yourself up with that if you lose any air at all. Uh, especially to the right rear quarter panel. And he was actually putting himself closer to Bubba than what Bubba was uh, actually trying to, to hang on to his quarter panel. So between uh, or to his side. And so between the two, uh, I just believe that, uh, you know, that the hotter tires that they had on, uh, trying to go as hard as they were there, I'm pretty sure that he was uh, doing everything to run wide open and, and thinking that, you know, just one more corner and he was going to be able to clear Bubba and, and then, you know, kind of smooth selling from that point. So um, uh, shocking to say the least. Um, uh, now, you know, here's a driver that looked like he was going to uh, easily put himself through to the round of eight and he's going to have to battle now. And uh, that, that's the most shocking part of it that, you know, this was going to be four straight races in the playoffs uh, that Larson had performed at a high level. He did perform at a high level, just didn't get the finish yesterday. Yeah, it ends up finishing 31st. And like you said, he, he won stage two, but actually got uh, no stage points in stage one. So he comes away from this with only 16 points. Enters Talladega, which is certainly not one of his better tracks, just two points above the cut line. He was sort of in a similar situation in 2021, DJ, where at one point in the Roval race, he was he was out of it um, yep. and then came back to win that race despite having a mechanical problem. So I guess maybe the team can kind of fall back a little bit like, hey, we've been in round of 12 with our backs against the wall. But it just it seems like this has happened so often with this team this year. <laughs> uh, you know, Burton talked about this on the broadcast that I think Larson and he Larson told us this on playoff media day. I think he's been as fast or faster than he was in 21, yeah. but I, you know, I, I could go down the list. There's probably a half dozen races like this where he's crashed or things have just fell out of his favor. It just doesn't seem like it's, it's his year, even though he's got maybe the fastest car. Yeah, it, exactly. And, and and I don't know that we've seen something like this uh, in recent memory to where somebody was so dominant uh, and so fast at so many racetracks uh, William Byron, I think, has been the beneficiary maybe a couple of times uh, to mistakes or, or things happening with Larson and, and his team. And it's not always Larson uh, himself as the driver. Uh, it's just a number of things that they've taken themselves out of these races. And, you know, yeah, that was OK during the regular season. Yeah, it cost them uh, some some points at, at times. And 
uh, you know, you, you overlooked it and think, okay, well, by the playoffs, they'll clean all of this up. And, uh, you know, they just keep pushing. And, and um, you, you, at some point in time, this is going to catch up with you. And, uh, again, going to, you know, Talladega, where he certainly has not uh, had success. It's not that he can't drive those tracks. It's just that he seems to find himself in the wrong spot at the wrong time. And he's having a year like that already, expecting to get something good out of Talladega. Uh, that might be a tall order. Um, you, and you don't want to go to the Roval uh, thinking that you, you know, have to maximize everything at, at that point in time. So um, yeah, this is, um, it, it's, it's hard to fathom that, you know, we, we talk about how good Larson and this team are. And, and here we are now talking about, uh, you know, having to have two solid weeks or, or they're not going to find themselves in a position racing for a championship once again. Yeah, it is surprising. And as, again, what was the incident? I, I want to go back to what you were saying because I think you uh, made a really good point there about the way Larson needs to sort of enter the corner. And he, he made mention of this in his interview. He said something to the effect of that he was finding the right shape, I think is yeah. how he, the terminology he used. Uh, and, and Bubba actually expressed, I think a little bit remorse on the radio, uh, but was this just one of those sort of racing incidents where, I mean, it's nobody's fault. I mean, Larson certainly didn't seem to be frustrated with Bubba at all. Like he's running him tight, as he said, yeah. the way he's supposed to be. Um, just one of those incidents where Larson wants to run that corner a certain way. And for whatever reason, the air hits a certain way on that corner and it just takes him out. Yeah, it, it, this definitely just a uh, racing, hard racing, uh, you know, two drivers trying to to uh, to get themselves positioned to where they can win the race and, and move on in the playoffs. And, you know, Bubba did a great job of, of hanging with with Larson as long as he did um, on that outside, because that wasn't didn't seem to be Bubba's favorite spot to be in. And I think he made mention a couple of times during the race that as he got up higher, when the groove widened out, that his car was just so loose that he couldn't hold on to it. Uh, but he was able to get through turns three and four with Larson and then actually, you know, enter and go all the way down the front straightaway. So uh, nobody was doing anything wrong. Um, you know, Larson could have driven his car in that situation straighter into the corner, but then it was going to take turning the steering wheel more in the center to get the car to turn, maybe even having to get out of the gas a little bit uh, to that point. And if he does that, um, and Bubba seemed to be more comfortable on the outside at this particular time with his car, um, he, he probably – uh, was going to get a run off of turn two and maybe clear Larson. And then we were going to have a real battle from that point. And, and whether Larson could have got back by Bubba, he wasn't sure. He knew what he needed to do. I, I actually was a little surprised with the hotter tires, with how good Larson's car was on the, the high side and how he could arc his car in, that he chose the bottom at that particular yeah. point. Um, I really looked for him to take the top and, and just motor around and, and you know control the race from that point. But but he felt like that. I think he felt very sure of himself that that he could uh, make that bottom work. But you know he he has a way that he likes to drive the car and wants to drive the car. And anything else was going to uh, take away his ability that he thought that he could could control the race and get himself back out front. So just hard racing, and you know that's what this has come down to. And again, I think the one thing that you hear these drivers uh, talk about, and when I talk to them about these cars, is that. You know, you're good, good, good until you're not. And, and then there's just no saving it at, at the speed that it was. And I, I'll give Larson credit. Bubba did a good job of of realizing what was happening and moving up the track. Uh, but Larson held on as long as he could and, and didn't try to overcorrect. If he just tries to correct that a little bit, he's going to you know, have to turn right and shoot straight up into Bubba. And, and then we've got a whole nother. Uh, set of circumstances and things to talk about uh, in, in taking Bubba out there. So uh, uh, I'll give Larson credit when he got to that point, uh, but that is that point of no return that these drivers talk about driving this car in these situations. Yeah, I noticed that as well. Larson's crash avoidance, well, avoiding others when he's crashing, almost as impressive sometimes as his driving, like the way he locked it down. And like you said, he didn't overcorrect. He, he managed to stay out of other people's way. So it sounds like DJ, when you're talking about like how difficult the cars are to drive, one, they give you no warning. And then two, with the lack of warning, there's just, it's not as forgiving. There's no way to save it. W would it be easier if you had no warning with previous cars where you could save it and this car, you just, you can't, is that the deal? 
Yeah, because and the main thing is is that with with the shape and body design that that they went to, uh, where in the older cars and the uh, those generation of cars, um, you know, they, they everybody had worked really hard on the side force uh, with the cars, and so that would save you a lot. You know, I, I used to be amazed that oh my gosh, how are these guys are they that much better drivers than the past generations of, of drivers uh, that that they don't spin these things out? But you know, they'd gotten to the point that they they relied on that so much. Now they have the, the they have two things they're dealing with with these next gen cars. I mean, the, the cars are basically straight up cars, so you don't have an offset to them. Uh, so that that in turn makes you do things to make the car turn uh, that really loosens the car up uh, to to create speed. And then the second thing is is you don't have that side force, and and once you lose any grip, uh, then you don't have anything to help catch you. Yes, they have a wider tire, uh, which is beneficial to them. Uh, but when you start talking about the air and the crazy things that it does, uh, it, that that happens so quickly that there's just no overcoming that. And uh, especially you know, if you're by yourself and, and you find yourself getting loose, you have a little bit better chance than we've seen some drivers do that. But when you're beside a car and you're trying not to take your other competitor out uh, at the same time, uh, then, then you just got nothing to do. So I don't think we give them enough credit for all they're having to do to, to make these cars uh, go fast. And, and as you go fast, uh, you, you start losing more control. And, and these are the type of things that we see happen. Yeah. And uh, like you said, I, I, it, it did seem like the high line uh, worked really well for Larson. It worked well for Bubba too, which is the next two restarts. Bubba chooses the outside just like just like Larson didn't. Larson chose the inside, and obviously it didn't work out so well for him. So Bubba chooses the outside on the next restart, and it works for him. Um, then there's another crash. Bubba's still in the lead. He chooses the outside again for the final restart, which is on lap 262. So Bubba's on the outside. Chase Briscoe is on the inside. And after maintaining the lead on that previous restart from the outside, Briscoe kind of forced the issue this time on Bubba from the inside. He got ahead of him. And then Bubba kind of laments what happened next. I'll, I'll read you the quote. Um, Bubba says, I just should have kept my line in the three and forced William Byron, who was on the inside, to get tight. Um, I'm just upset with myself. I know what I did, and I choked. So Byron takes the lead here with this battle between Wallace and Briscoe, DJ. And it seems like Bubba is saying that he wished he would have stayed up top uh, as he was entering turn three, rather than what he did was after getting around Briscoe, Bubba kind of came down the track and tried to side draft Byron. Um, and he sounds like Bubba's saying the better option would have been just hold my line at the top, entering three. Instead, he comes down the track, they get side by side, and that seemed to blunt Bubba's momentum. And then Byron pulls away for good and, and leads the rest of the race. How did you see uh, that restart where Bubba lost the lead to Byron? Yeah, it's, um, you know, Bubba got. Had I have to say that Briscoe put Bubba in a difficult spot because, I mean, he used up the racetrack and, and at one point I thought he was going to get into the side of them and, and almost did there. And that, you know, that's what allowed Byron to get the big run down the back straightaway uh, to, to make it three wide at, at that particular time. Yes. Bubba could have easily um, held the outside and possibly held on there. He he would have been able to probably control things a little bit better than that. But your instinct, as because I, I don't think that he could really see and have any idea without some spotters help exactly where Byron was. And Bubba started his his moves down to the bottom, and it looked like to me that Byron was going to be a little hesitant. He didn't want to drive in there and and, and just clip the the left rear above and, and send him spinning. And, and so I, I think they both hesitated just an in, a, just for a split second there. But as Bubba hesitated, Byron saw that hesitation. And I don't think Bubba choked in this. That, that's a tough, tough spot to get yeah. yourself in. You know, um, you know, it, it, Bubba didn't do anything wrong to get in that spot. And, and what he did wasn't it, it turned out to be the wrong thing, but it, it wasn't the wrong thinking that he was doing. If if I think if he would have gone on and committed completely to taking his car to the, the very bottom of the racetrack, that probably Byron's going to back out and not create a contact there because they could have ended both of their days. And, and I know that Byron didn't want to do that either, but he saw the, the slight hesitation uh, of Bubba not to 
completely uh, force the issue and, and take his car right to the bottom and, and block any any move that Byron was making there. So he just opened the door. Again, that's not, you know, I, I don't blame him for that. He could have put himself in a position that, um, yeah, you, you know it's Byron, and, and most of the time William's not going to do something like that. He's a very fair driver. Um, yeah. But, you know, you're also talking the playoffs here, and, and drivers do a little more to, to try to make that happen. So, um, yeah, I heard Bubba talking about him choking. He, you know, that that's not choking. That That's, um, you know, making a move. He'll know the next time, you know, it, that that's learning. You know, he's, he's still having to learn how to race in, in a different set of circumstances than what he normally is. Most of the time through his career, you know, where he – where he's been racing in those spots has been probably from fifth to 10th. And they don't mean, don't mean nearly as much as, as what they do when you're racing there for the lead and talk about getting yourself into the round of eight. And it, you know, again, we can sit and I was watching it on TV and, and know what I thought I would have done. Um, but that's just how you learn in, in this sport. Uh, there, there's no better way. And the next time it happens, uh, you know, Bubba gets through this and and he goes on to Las Vegas at a mile and a half track. He's going to know that he's going to do something a little different if that situation occurs again. Yeah, I think we forget that it's his sixth full-time season in the Cup Series. But to your point, which is an excellent one, he hasn't been in this situation where the spotlight is on him this much until the last few years. I mean, his first few years, a lot of this type of racing where he's learning, he's getting that experience was not for the lead and a playoff race over round of 12 opener. And I think you're right. I think that's where the, you know, I choked kind of comes from that, that harsh self-evaluation. So Bubba started from the pole in this race, DJ, he finishes third, um, doesn't get get great stage points, gets stage points in both the first two, but not as many as you'd expect for leading 111 laps, a race high. Uh, But again, does finish third, but he comes out of this two points below the cut line. Uh, and even though in his interview right after the race, he said he hadn't even looked at the points yet, I'm sure that was on his mind, knowing that he he's yeah. coming in the playoffs without playoff points, knowing that it's kind of winner else to make the round of eight. Even a third place finish probably doesn't uh, mollify the fact that like, hey, Talladega and Ro- Roval are next. And he probably, I mean, he's a past winner at Talladega, but he probably doesn't feel great about his chances <laughs> the next two weeks of advancing. Yeah, that, that's the, the hard part of, of this and the playoffs. and and the hard part of, you know, not having the regular season that you want going in. And he's not the only one in this situation. I mean, you know, we've already eliminated four uh, and mainly because they didn't have a good regular season and have points to, to fall back on. Um, you know, a couple of them, you know, Harvick even, even did have a few points there and, and he wasn't able to, to advance either. So, uh, you know, that's the, the hard thing when you're in that situation and when we reset, uh, after for for each round, um, you know, people that you outperformed um, all of a sudden are way ahead of you once again, and and you have to be almost perfect uh, in the situation when you were the you know the 16th seed coming in, um, and, and you have zero points basically uh, to to fall back on, uh, even though you you had a good round and he did everything you needed to do uh, in the round of 16. Uh, you know, he's back in that same situation, so it is a a battle each and every weekend, unless uh, you're fortunate enough to, to go grab that win. And, you know, Bubba was so close there. It's, um, I, I hope that today he's sitting looking at, yeah, you know, you know, I've done a, a good job uh, in these four races uh, of doing what I can do, uh, putting us in the situation uh, to, to advance. And, um, you know, I think that he, uh, you know, embraces as much as you can embrace Talladega. I, I know that he likes that style of racing. Um, you, you might not like it quite as much when you realize everything that's on the line. Uh, you know, your season is basically there. Um, but but if he does his normal good job, he's really good at avoiding most things and and getting finishes if, and putting himself in a position to possibly win uh, at a track like Talladega. So um, I, I just hope that he he not as hard on himself and says, hey, you know, we, we had our chance there. We, we did everything we could. Um, it just, yeah, they could have, could they have gotten more stage points? Yeah, it's easy to look back and say that. But, you know, I think they were setting themselves up more to know that they had a fast car to put themselves in a position to be there at the end to try to win. They did exactly that. Yeah, and 
I agree with you. I mean, Denny Ham once said it before the playoff started that round of 12 was the goal for Bubba and Reddick. Anything beyond that is a bonus. They both made the round of 12. And Marty Snyder said a couple of times during the weekend, and I agree with him, you know, is Bubba Wallace the surprise of the playoffs? I think through four races, you can, can certainly say so. Uh, but as we're coming out here out of Texas, William Byron, the only guy who's not worried now going into the next two races. And you know, I think the last time I had you on the podcast, DJ, was after William Byron's win at Watkins Glen. And you were saying then that, you know, this is the new modern era driver, the iRacer who becomes this fully formed, really impressive stock car driver. I, I don't know what more else there is to say, what's left to say about William Byron. I did hear Dale Jr. talking yesterday that in you know, his racecraft uh, really is impressive. We certainly saw that in the final restart, but just looking at his race, I mean, he wins the race, but he, he doesn't finish top 10 stage two, finishes fourth in stage one, just sort of hung around um, and gave himself a chance when his teammate Larson crashed. And then when, when Bubba kind of opened the door, uh, like you said, so William Byron's race, I mean, just another example of a guy who uh, forced to be reckoned with and probably somebody we're going to see in Phoenix. Yeah. That I don't think there's any doubt now. And, and, you know, you could look at that and, and I think, you know, Burton and, and Dale Jr. both said yesterday that, hey, you know, this this wasn't a William Byron dominant performance like what he had at Watkins Glen. Um, you know, it was reminiscent of some others uh, wins that he's had this year of, of of setting himself up, never basically giving up on the races. I mean, you know, at one point he was mired back 18th to 22nd there um, as things happened uh, there in stage two. And, and I really wasn't sure – that he had the car to, to find his way back to the front yesterday. Uh, I, I thought that he might have something that he could get back in the top 10. And of course, with his points, um, you know, that would have been good to set himself up well to, to go into these next two races in this round of 12. But, um, you know, he's just a, a battler and, uh, you know, he's confident in his abilities and he takes advantage of situations. And that's what you have to do is ready to, to do that. They, the things that he is doing and that Rudy is doing for him to put him in these situations, I mean, you know, this is the the mark of of champions and and the way that drivers and teams go about winning championships. Uh, you know, winning races when you not don't have your best days. Uh, that that's how you do things and and do them in a big way and and go about winning and putting yourself in position to win championships. So I look for him to be a part of the championship for no doubt. Uh, easiest road to to get there for him. I mean, you know, when you get to the round of eight that you're talking about, um, you know, this, it probably sets up as good for William Byron as anyone else in the field. Yeah. And, you know, he said after this race that he's going to be in the simulator probably tomorrow working on Vegas, which is a luxury no one else is really going to have the way that team is. And yeah, that's going to be, I think, a, a huge advantage when you look forward to Vegas homestead martinsville I and mean, those are three really good tracks for william byron and you know rudy fugel said it too after the after the win yesterday that they're going to look now at, now they've got 41 playoff points i mean this is five more playoff points on yeah. top of the 36 they already had coming out of the regular season um and now i think he said that they'll probably look at it like if we need 120 points to advance to the championship four if that's kind of like the number that's the benchmark yeah. uh that's like William Byron's probably going to need like 80 points in the round of eight. Now, granted, he could win any of those three races, but if you're asking somebody of that team's caliber to just average 30 points a race, yeah. it just it feels like it lays out really well for him right now. Yeah, yeah. Unless there's just some, you know, something unfortunate happens at Las Vegas, and then the pressure becomes a little bit more uh, for Homestead and Martinsville, two track cities, one at. Um, yeah. So you know he can can certainly do that, but it does ramp up the pressure because you're literally getting down to it. But, um, you know, I, I think that with what we've seen, uh, th there's nothing just telling us that that th this should be anything but um, simpler uh, for him. You know, th it allows them to actually uh, look at it. And I know that a stage win is only one point, but you don't know when one point is going to make the difference. But it does allow them to do that these next two weekends, uh, you know, if nothing else, just to try to, to set themselves up to try to get a, another point or two uh, to have in the bank. And, and as you point out, if you're, if we're looking that he has to get, you know, you're looking at less than 30, um, you know, if he goes yeah. in there with, with 41 that he has now or a little more. So, um, you know, that's just 
running average for, for that race team. And, and, you know, they should easily be able to do that. I think that it's everyone else that now realizes that William Byron has, has set himself up as the favorite. Uh, he's put himself there. You know, a lot of other people are saying, yeah, you know, Denny's got a fast car. Larson's got a fast car. But, um, you know, I know Denny's in good shape with his points, but, you know, Larson's got a real battle on his hands. And, you know, that just takes its toll on you. Uh, you know, William's got uh, a couple of weeks to, to relax and prepare himself uh, for the next round as everybody else is still looking at uh, the terrors uh, that, uh, that come with racing at Talladega. Yeah, and you know, all of that happening too within the walls of Hendrick Motorsports with that Larson v. Byron battle. And I'll, in the 300th win for Rick Hendrick, I'll just give you a chance to, to comment on that, DJ, because of the historical significance. It's not the most ever by a team owner because Rick Hendrick got that mark 30 wins ago when he passed <laughs> Petty Enterprises with 270. Uh, now he's got 300. I, I you know, I, I don't even know how to put it. I mean, it's not like it's a surprise. Everybody knows this is the best team in NASCAR and, you know, will go down as the best team probably for decades. I mean, I, it, is anybody ever going to top Hendrick Motorsports? I don't see how that you're going to do that. Uh, I mean, the, just look at the lineup that, that you talk about. I mean, you, you go all the way back and, and realize, you know, how close uh, this organization and Rick Hendrick himself came to, to closing this and shutting this down uh, because, you know, as he got involved as a, you know, car dealer and, and uh, you know, albeit that, you know, that was his business and he really was and still is very good at that. Um, you know, racing was a passion for him and, um, you know, except for that faithful win by Jeff Bodine uh, uh, many, many years ago uh, that kind of kept them afloat. Uh, at you know, Who knows what would have happened. But go from that point and just look at the lineup of drivers and, and what they were able to accomplish, the, the wins that they, they have put there. And uh, it's just been incredible, the, the lineup and uh, the success. You know, yeah, there have been a couple of years that, that weren't their very best and, and the most um, – profitable and it wasn't didn't have the domination effect um uh, but for so many of the years they've just so competitive not just with one driver sometimes not just with two but you know they throw they come at you from all angles and at, at every different type of track and to to think about 300 wins and and the effort that it takes not just from the drivers uh but from the standpoint of everyone behind the scenes and uh you know there you could you could go down a lot of people. Uh, you could go all the way back to, you know, how their engine program was so dominant at the beginning with Randy Dorton, uh, who unfortunately was lost in that airplane crash. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it went on because of how good Randy was and the people that he surrounded himself with. And, and you can say that going to the point of the, the crew chiefs and, and everyone running, uh, helping run uh, Ken House for that's was there forever, has been there forever. And, and, you know, kind of behind the scenes guy that everybody in the garage area knows about, but maybe not a lot of fans know about. And, uh, uh, but then, you know, you talk about Ray Everham and Jack Denouse and all that they've done to, to continue to, to make this uh, uh, an organization that you have to deal with week in and week out. But, you know, congratulations to them, just an incredible feat. And no, I don't see how someone puts together an organization and a lineup that, that can come anywhere close to this again. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it's going to happen this century for sure. At no. this point. Um, and <laughs> I, I mean, you're right. Like it, it was cool to hear Rick Hendrick bring up the Martinsville win by Jeff Bodine in 1984 that sort of saved this organization. And Rick Hendrick went out of his way yesterday to, to name check Randy Dorton. And uh, I mean, you're right, DJ and next it's hard to believe, but next year will mark 20 years since he and tragically those nine other people were killed in that plane crash on the way to, to Martinsville. And um, I, what he built there and the depth of that organization just endures. Uh, and, you know, other teams are still going to keep trying to catch him. And we can yeah. talk about some of those other ones now uh, coming out of Texas. The first one I want to ask you about is, is Denny Hamlin. I think you're, you're right. I mean, we, we spent the round of 16 talking about how it's Hamlin versus Larson. This feels like these are definitely the two best teams the two fastest cars the two best drivers so far in the playoffs hamlin finished fifth yesterday at texas um had a good run but things were never quite the same after he has this pit road collision in stage one with his teammate ty gibbs um steve Wittart was very critical he thought ty gibbs 
was in the wrong lane here in the in the in the pits. Uh, Ty Gibbs sort of fessed up to that a little bit in his interview. Said, "I I think I guess that's on me." How did you see that as a driver? Was that a case of Denny was not given enough room by his teammate? Yeah, he, he probably wasn't. Um, but yeah, you know, there's so much happening and, and there's so much on the line that you know you're you're doing what you think you need to to do, and, and it's not you know you're not always thinking about. Um, the consequences of, you know, and, and paying attention. I think that's what's so important. Drivers, there's, there's so much on them now because the competition is so close, you know, that the pit stops are, you know, we're, we're talking tenths of the seconds that, that make the difference in uh, either gaining a spot or, or possibly losing two, three, four spots. And, and you know how hard it is uh, once you get back on the racetrack with these restarts to, to make up those positions. And, you know, the drivers become frustrated. Um, I, I, you know, Tides, he's still young at this and, and, you know, getting to know everyone and exactly, you know, what's the right thing and right place to be. So, um, you know, I, I, it, it, it was unfortunate. Um, I, I don't, you know, Denny handled it, it very well, I think, uh, in, in his interview. And, you know, sometimes things are just going to happen. And, you know, this will be another case. Yeah, you know, I talked about Bubba learning from, from what happened with him on the racetrack, you know, Ty will also learn from this and, and understand pit road and, and positioning yourself uh, a little bit better and, and understanding that part. So, you know, th sometimes things just happen and, you know, we always seem to have to want to put a blame on and, and, you know, you, you, you can say that, yeah, Denny wasn't given much room, uh, but, but Denny made a pretty hard right out of there, which he had to do uh, to, to get himself out and, and moving forward. Uh, but, uh, I, I just look at this as, you know, they'll they'll all learn. And it was unfortunate for Denny because it didn't seem his car had the speed after that that it had before. And, you know, that, yesterday morning I text Steve Latart just, you know, him being there, me not, just trying to, you know, see who I, I was actually setting my fantasy lineup and, and <laughs> I was wanting to know, yeah, who, who he thought uh, might be. And, you know, his comment was that the 5 and the 11 were in, a, in one league and then, you know, there were some fast cars, Byron and, and um, a number of others that, that had good cars. Um, but, you know, he said these two, once again, are, are the class of the field. And, and they were showing that until that point. Yeah, yeah. And your point about Ty Gibbs is well taken, that, like, th these guys have so much that they're asked to do now. Um, and it, it made me think of something Burton said. When, when Daniel Suarez spun coming into the pits during the race yesterday, Burton was kind of explaining on the broadcast that you don't understand now in the the – the era of EFI data and so much stuff that teams can look at and scrutinize and say to their drivers, you need to do a better job of getting in the pits here. You need yeah. to do a better job of getting off here. Can, can you imagine the level of scrutiny these guys face that, I mean, you, I mean, you're a hall of famer. Right? I'm not questioning your talent or your results or anything like that, but you probably didn't have to deal or, you know, drivers of your generation didn't have to worry about people criticizing, like how you're getting in and out of the pits as much as they get criticized now. No, it is every facet, you know, every corner they make um, on the racetrack. And then you get down to the point of trying to get everything that you can and then understanding and hearing from it. No, I this it drives me crazy. I'm not even driving now. Uh, I don't even know how I would have taken that because it's not that I didn't wouldn't take, you know, uh, you know, the the criticism, if you will, at times about getting beat in certain spots, you know, getting on off pit road. You know, I came through an era that, you know, at the, towards the very end of it, uh, as it was that, you know, we, there was no pit road speed. We waste race wide open, you That's know, right. to our pit box, uh, which yeah. was it's scary to think about that, that we did that for as long as we did. But, um, but now you're, you you know, everything is there. You, you can't even say, Yes, I am getting there as fast as they are, you know, because a visual to that, uh, you can dispute that. But when you have the evidence that they have there, uh, these drivers are, you know, it's, it's just a whole nother level of pressure that, that you have to deal with and, and understanding that, you know, if you don't do it, then Monday morning or Tuesday morning, whichever you have your team meeting at, um, you know, it's going to be brought up. And uh, if not during the race, I mean, you know, they they might tell you that, you know, the last time that you were on pit road that, you know, you weren't getting as much as what, uh, you know, Kyle Larson or Denny Hamlin or Kyle Busch was getting. So, uh, uh, you know, that makes things more difficult and don't know that I would enjoy that <laughs> as much, but uh, it, it is, 
you know, it's fascinating to watch and listen uh, as these teams try to coach their drivers and get the very most out of them. Yeah, it is another layer of pressure uh, that they have to handle. And, uh, you know, one driver who we've certainly seen handle it really well in the playoffs the last two years, Ross Chastain, finishes second in this race, DJ. And now, you know, he's still only 12 points above the cut line, but this is a guy who only entered the playoffs with 11 playoff points, one win in the regular season. So I think he's fairly well situated here, especially being a past Talladega winner, but uh, for advancement to the round of eight. But let's talk about Texas in his performance because. He has this throttle sensor issue, which he somehow overcomes to finish second in the second half of this race. And I just, again, this is something I don't think you would have had to deal with because it sounds like it's, I think, EFI type related where um, you know he's pushing the throttle down and the car won't go. Um, <laughs> and he has to just like run it wide open to get out of the pits on his last couple of stops just to make the car move. Um, just, I don't know, the, the grace under pressure of this kid continues to... Um, impress me I, I, I your thoughts on ross chastain yeah I, I think first and foremost they they brought a car again uh with way more speed than than what they have had for the majority of the year so that was impressive to begin with uh they had something that we could see ross use his talents on the track but when this uh throttle issue uh came about there and, and first he, his car he stalled the car trying to get exited pit and he lost a ton of spots then that particular run, when he got back in the traffic and was having to deal with this, um, he totally missed turn one one time. And I, I wasn't even sure at that time if, if this thing had maybe hung wide open uh, because it was like he just completely missed uh, turn one. And and I thought that he might get into the wall at that point in time, but he lost more spots. I pretty much counted him out uh, of yeah. this race that, you know, this is going to be another – sad story of to, to their season that, you know, trying to follow up on uh, being a part of the championship four last year, that they just weren't going to be able to perform at a high enough level somehow, some way, I don't know what they did and what was done, uh, how he managed to not crash his car and get so frustrated during that time. Uh, but uh, the end of the race was, um, you know, quite interesting to watch him. And, and it was Ross like driving uh, that, that we came, you know, other than the fact that, you know, he showed that he could make passes and not have contact, but he set it up really well. And, and it was a, a very, it, it might be the performance that, that we look back on. If he does go on to be a part of the championship four or, you know, just into the round of eight that we look back at Texas and what he did for the last third of the race to get a finish out of this, when it looked like it could be another uh, day of disaster for them. Yeah. And it was a day of disaster for, a few other drivers and self-inflicted, unfortunately, in the case of Ryan Blaney and, and Martin Trex Jr. Let's start with uh, Blaney, who gets caught speeding on pit entry under caution on lap uh, 214 uh, and then is back in the pack in traffic, uh, gets caught in the wreck. And, uh, you know, Blaney says that that speeding penalty re that really took us out of it. That took us out of having a good finish when you when you put yourself back there. Um I don't think Ryan Blaney's out of it entirely, DJ, because the, the next two races set up fairly well for him. He's won at Talladega. He's won at the Roval. But it, it feels like this is a recurring theme with Ryan Blaney with mistakes in the playoffs. We were talking about this last year with speeding penalties or mistakes. Um, how does he get past it? Um, yeah, again, you know, we, we want to you know give them some you know time to, to learn uh, their craft. And, you know, uh, again, learning in a different part of it when you you know you talk about the playoffs the added pressures uh and i know they try to deflect a lot of that but you still have to do your job and you have to learn and, and understand that you know it's no different than you know the atlanta braves bringing in a relief pitcher and you know you you've played a great game and he comes in the ninth inning and you know gives up two walks and you know that probably 80 percent of the time that that you walk someone they end up scoring and yeah. It's just mistakes that you try to stay away from that they can continue to happen. And it's no different with, with drivers that, you know, you know these things. Uh, but when you're in the heat of the moment and, and Blaney was having a good day and, and you understand that you can't give up anything on, on pit entry, getting down pit road, getting out of your pit box, um, you, you have to do it all. It takes all of that to, to continue to give yourself a chance to run uh, in the top five. And 
But you, you at some point, you, you've got to settle yourself down and, and realize that, you know, mistakes are what lead to worse things happening. And, and it's the, the worst thing that you can do for yourself is, is put yourself in that position. And uh, because, you know, um, you know, so yeah, it's a high percentage of time that you get yourself back there, especially these late race restarts and, and things start happening. Blaney well, did nothing wrong on the lap that he got involved in the crash other than the fact that, you know, he was 15 spots worse than, than where he should have been running. Yeah. And like you said, I mean, pretty tough on a day when the, uh, the Fords aside from Roush Fenway, uh, Roush Fenway Kozlowski racing haven't been running all that well. Um, Blaney was having a decent day and unfortunately misses out on a lot of points, comes out 11 points below the cut line. Uh, the other driver, I don't want to be too tough on Martin Truex Jr. because I, it wasn't his fault necessarily that he gets in this uh, incident at the end of stage one where he gets hit from behind, um, kind of spins out, and he says that the car underneath damaged some things and, and it was way tighter after that. It never handled quite as well. Uh, he spun late, um, but... I'll just read you what he what he told Dustin Long after the race, DJ, which was this, you know, just piles on top of each other. And that on top of that, our pit stops were horrendous. Um, Dustin had this stat that uh, the last three four tire stops for Truex were between 11.2 and 12.7 seconds. Compare that to Denny Hamlin, whose were between 9.9 and 10.8. So as Truex said, just a long, terrible day. But yet. His 17th place finish at Texas was his best finish of the playoffs, which I mean, tells you everything about what's going on with the 19 team right now, regular season champions. And um, I just, I can't get over how mediocre they've been. Uh, and, 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 you know, Kyle Petty is saying DJ that he doesn't think Truex makes the championship four at this point. I mean, he's still 19 points above the cut line going into Talladega, but Talladega is obviously one of his worst tracks. He's won at the Roval, but that's, the X factor. Um, what what do you make of True X at this point? I, I think that you're being kind when you say that their playoffs have been mediocre. Um, that <laughs> this has been a disaster. I, I cannot believe that the regular season champ and uh, yeah, I was ready to pencil Martin Truex Jr. in as the you know one of the you know along with Larson and, and Denny Hamlin as and probably William Byron. That that was kind of your your championship four that you're you were looking at, and um, that there has not been a single race from the drop of the green flag in these playoffs. And I realized just four races in, but there hasn't been a single race when you said, Oh yeah. Uh, you know, they're going to be good today. They, even when they qualified, well, they, they went on the backslide to, to start with at Kansas uh, as soon as they dropped the green flag and, you know, then they ran over something and punctured a tire. So it's just, you know, one thing after another. And, and you talk about these pit stops that just once again, put yourself and put your driver in a bad spot. Um, and you, you're not able to run the race the, the way that you want to. So I, I, I have no idea um, if they're going to be able to, to make it through to the next round. And if they do, even how they can go about cleaning it up whenever you, know, you talk about another mile and a half track uh, or two of them coming at tracks you would think that Martin would be all right with Las Vegas and Homestead. But I, I, there's nothing telling me that they're right. on that path again, as good as they were there at a point in time during this season. Um, you know, they're twice as bad as they were good. And uh, but you know that 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 body of work may somehow, some way, uh, get them through. And and we'll have to see if they can can rebound from this. I, I I'm gonna be blunt and honest. Uh, and this is hanging around Kyle Petty uh, as much as I do, which I love to do. And uh, but you but you learn to kind of say what's on your mind and. And, uh, you know, I think there's a disconnect there between James Small and, and the rest of the team, not just their driver, but the rest yeah. of the team now. Uh, he's got to get a handle on this, and he better do it much sooner than later. Can you see that externally, DJ, that it's, I mean, again, not to be too blunt, but is it just a leadership thing where the, the, the team isn't kind of on the same page for whatever reason? Yeah, it just seems that they're, you know, their their race cars aren't prepared when the race starts, and uh, you know they're overlooking things. And um, you know, you go back to Darlington where you know Truex had gotten into the the, the fence in in their short uh, practice time, uh, and they didn't you know find the issue there. I mean, you know, when you hit the wall, you've got and, and I realize they're 
you know, they're trying not to start in the rear. Um, but when you, when something like that happens, you know, these, the parts and pieces on these cars now are just seem so fragile and, and they're obviously so very important, but, but they, you know, just the slightest bend uh, in them. And, and we're talking something maybe minute, uh, but it, but it is findable and um, you know, not to do that. I, I just think that, that leadership uh, and that starts at the very top with the crew chief. You know, he's got to be in charge of his people. Uh, you know, if it's someone else's fault, then he needs to be on top of them and making sure they're doing their job better. So, you know, I think it starts right there. Uh, you know, I can't can't put the blame uh, on Martin, but, you know, is some of it, uh, uh, is he not, you know, connected enough there to, to be telling him exactly, you know, what he's looking for and, and the issues that he's going through. But uh, they, they better figure things out quickly. And and it's not that I don't think that James Hall, he is outstanding crew chief and, and hey, wouldn't want the job. But, you know, you put yourself in. You're, you're the one that, you know, when I said who wants to be crew chief, he raised his hand. And, uh, you know, you, you when you're going good and, and you're getting a, a lot of the credit, then when things aren't going good, uh, you're going to get a lot of the blame at that point in time, too. So, uh, yeah, I think it starts right there at the top. And I, I would hope and think that they're in meetings as, as you and I are talking right now, uh, uh, discussing how they can be better whenever they get to Talladega and the Rover. Yeah, the time is uh, growing short and uh, for them to, to get things turned around here. But like you said, that's what he signed up for. That's the job. And uh, they just they got to do it at this point, just like your job is to give us that candor and insight and the bluntness that we love from you and KP. And so we definitely appreciate all those comments. Let's wrap up uh, going to Talladega. Now you're, you'll be there this weekend, uh, race Sunday on NBC. A any way to predict what's going to happen here? I mean, I was looking back earlier this year and I'd forgotten that Kyle Busch won this race. I think he said that they kind of just backed into it. Uh, just one of those typical Talladega type races where I don't think anybody really dominated. Um, any thoughts on what we might see Sunday? Yeah, it, it, there, there are just so many drivers that you can look at and then go down the list and say, you know, they, they've got a real chance at, at winning this and moving themselves through. And then, you know, talk about drivers that, you know, right now might look like they're, they're in, in a bad spot. Uh, Blaney being one of those, uh, he's as good as there is, uh, uh, on these type tracks with these cars right now. Um, you know, Brad Keselowski, uh, for many years was the guy to beat uh, at Talladega. And, and I think what we've seen recently at Daytona and Talladega as this team has gotten better that, uh, and certainly with, uh, his and Chris Busher's performance at Daytona uh, just a few short weeks ago, uh, you know, that makes you think that either Brad or, or Busher could, could get there. So yeah, that's three Fords that we know uh, that will be there. You know, Denny Hamlin is, is as good at this as, as anyone else does. Does he run the race to try to win? Does he run the race that's going to gather him a lot of stage points to begin with? Um, and put himself in a position uh, to where points are going to matter and, and he does maybe have to go after the win or it opens him up to, to go win. So this is, this is a great spot for this race. It's so cruel to the drivers <laughs> to put them in this position, but you have to run it somewhere. And um, it, it just makes for, you know, as tense a 500 mile racing as what we see anywhere. And, and we know that, you know, it, it hasn't generally with, with this uh, next gen car been uh, as much three wide racing at Daytona, but we did see more of that uh, just five weeks ago. But now uh, you, we expect that to, to happen at Talladega. And, um, you know, the pushing and shoving uh, ramps up as the race goes on. So I, you know, it's so hard to predict what might happen. We, we know that there's one guy that doesn't care about anything else that other than trying to get another win, that's William Byron. Uh, as far as the points go, but there's a lot of other people that, you know, I look outside the playoffs and, and just as we saw Chase Briscoe making a huge effort there yesterday and trying to win that race on a late restart, uh, you know, drivers can maybe save their careers. They certainly can save their, their seasons by going and, and getting a win at Talladega. And you know, that just adds more drama to the, to the mix uh, for the, the 12 playoff drivers that are left in there. I actually will count it as 11 because Byron, you know, doesn't matter what happens with him. But the other 11, I, as good as it looks, Denny's in position, um, you know, he goes and gets in something early there. Then all of a sudden the Roval becomes a, 
a real pressure packed situation for, for Denny Hamlin too. So it's just going to be fascinating to watch and, and see how the different drivers go about, you know, collecting stage points and positioning themselves to try to win at the end of this. I, I really can't wait. It, you know, I, I remember the first race that, that I worked after I retired and I went to Talladega and, and of course I was covering it at the time for ESPN and to get in the booth and, and watch that uh, race, it, it was like, oh my, God, these guys are crazy. And I was just <laughs> racing with them, you know, a year before and uh, yeah. but just to, to see that and, and it's gotten no less insane uh, to this point. So uh, should be fun. Yeah. Can one of these drivers get it done? I, I just can't. I know we have to wait a whole week and I'm going to play a few rounds of golf between now and then and try to enjoy that. But I really cannot wait to Sunday to, to see exactly what's going to transpire. Yeah, the stakes certainly have never been higher. A lot higher than they were 15 years ago when you called that yes. Talladega race for, <laughs> for ESPN, although they're always high at this place. And yeah, the inversely proportional theory of what's bad for drivers is good for us as media <laughs> and as fans watching, um, you know. I hate it for them, but it's 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 fun for us to to watch yeah. it on the other side. So yes, it uh, and it's always fun having you on the NASCAR and NBC podcast, DJ. Thanks for uh, giving me so much of your time and insight and uh, safe travels. Enjoy Talladega. All right. Thanks, Nate. Good talking with you. Hi, I'm Parker Kligerman. For more access like this from Pit Road, be sure to click and subscribe to the Motorsports and NBC YouTube channel.